Welcome community members. Our guest today is Ms. Karen Mason Bennett, the Executive Director of Northern Environmental Action Team, known as the NEED. Welcome Karen to the program. Thanks for having me. So my first question is, please tell us about the establishment of NEED and how long it has been there and what's its role in the community? Uh, so NEED was established in 1989. Um, it's got some heavy roots in the community and it was originally intended as a, it was a community-based effort to ensure that there were recycling services available in Fort St. John. And so NEAT originally started, um, if you've been here a little while, the Eco Depot. Um, so that that recycling business was started by NEAT um, years and years and years ago. Uh, then in 1997, we transitioned into um, education and outreach and sold the depot um, and then moved into services for the Peace River Regional District. And so we did that for about 20 years and uh, in 2018 kind of branched out a little bit further. So we've been dabbling really heavily in food security, um, energy security and conservation um, and yeah. Agriculture is the is the new kind of addition to our team. Great, thank you. And does it operate like a nonprofit having a board of directors? Yeah, we're a nonprofit organization, so we have a full board, um, and they're a non remunerated board member. There, <laughs> it's a volunteer position, um, and then we run a couple of social enterprises underneath the nonprofit umbrella. So, um, a social enterprise is just a program area that is designed to bring a profit into the organization. And then, as you know, the only difference between a nonprofit and a regular business is that we reinvest any profits that are coming in into our programming. We don't pay. Excellent. And what type of memberships are offered by NEED? Uh, we've got a few options available. So we've got a general kind of just individual and family membership that's available. Um, and then we get into more specialized uh, spaces. So we've got two levels of cohort memberships, which are producer members that are locally um, involved either in small scale meat production or horticultural production typically. Uh, and those memberships allow those producer members to have access to um, subsidized farm labor over the summer. And they also uh, provide access to research and development programs as well as um, education programs for themselves. So like how to how to actually start a regenerative farm, what is permaculture principles, how do we support soil um, as a carbon uh, strategy, and, um, and then they also can sell through the fireweed market. Um, and then we've got some education memberships as well. So again, for teachers, small, our small community schools, and then larger educational institutions. And those ones are not quite in play yet, but uh, we're working on programming to, to uh, um, activate those. Excellent. And what are the programs which have been offered by NEAT in our northern BC communities? <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> so uh, we've got three kind of bucket areas of programming. So we've got the northern cohort, which is what I was speaking about before with the two levels of producer membership. And so those programs are really designed as a horticultural support network. Um, so what we're looking at doing is um, we're looking at building capacity and supply within the local horticultural scene. And the difference between horticulture and just general crops is that we're looking at fruits and vegetables typically. So uh, hascaps, uh, soft cherries, um, any of those guys, as well as your typical vegetables, um, boxes and things like that are all kind of considered in there. We're not looking at large scale canola or wheat or any of that kind of production at this point in time. Um, and so the cohort offers a variety of programming. One of them uh, is our Eco Farm Skills, which provides summer students as um, subsidized labor for local farms. And we've been able to place probably close to 20 students over the last few years in local farms. And so um, producers have the ability to say on Tuesday, I'd like a, I'd like two students from eight to five um, and where we'll send them out. They, you know, do whatever tasks need to be done, uh, which allows the producers to not have to worry about hiring their own full-time labor over the summer. They can really control their costs. Um, and then the other space within that program is research and development. So we're looking at a, a bunch of opportunities to not only increase the growing capacity of the region um, as it relates very specifically to fruits, vegetables, and um, meat, but also to um, activate that production method as a way to mitigate carbon um, 
and to store carbon in the soil. So we're looking at it as a climate mitigation strategy as well. So that's the northern cohort in kind of in a nutshell. Um, there's some marketing and distribution supports that are coming there. We're working on a food hub um, and all of those pieces are, are pretty significant, um, both in programming, but also in infrastructure. Um, so not all of them are, are fully realized at this point in time. Then we run an education program. And so that's our need effects. Um, Kind of umbrella and underneath that we have some pretty dynamic partnerships so we've designed and we deliver pacific northern gases um, energy okay. conservation program and and that's all across northern bc so we work with about six school districts and we see grades four and five students in that program uh, we also have designed Food Secure Kids, which uh, is in schools locally right now. So if you're driving around Fort St. John and see school gardens kicking around, that's um, that's the Food Secure Kids program. So we're we're looking at a K to six program there that really explores food security through the lens of you know a, a northern community. What does this look like? So we're not looking at growing farmers necessarily, but what we're really looking at doing is supporting um, the respect people have for how much effort and energy and you know. You know, blood, sweat, and tears go into actually getting the food that you um, are purchasing either at the farmer's market or the grocery store to your plate. Um, we also run Camp Wildlings through the education program, and that uh, takes place out behind Northern Lights College in Fort St. John uh, through July and August. So we see about 70 kids there, and we've got some partnerships that are, are pretty significant there as well, both with the college and with gymnastics. Um, and we're really looking at... Um, investing in risky play. Um, so students and participants to the to that program are introduced to whittling and hatchets and they build base camps and they, you know, go they go play in the creek. And it really is driven by the desire of the participants on every day as to what they get up to. It's not a prescriptive kind of school-based kind of program. Um, it really is is led by the kids that are there, but we're looking at fostering uh, confidence. We're looking at making sure that they, um, they know how to move and how they can move within the environment, um, as well as as fostering respect for the, the natural space around them. And what we've seen is some really amazing results um, with students that really have a hard time at school uh, flourish in the forest. And we're um, really excited about the the experience that they're having there. And then we have some food security programs. <laughs> so we uh, operate locally Meals on Wheels in Fort St. John. Uh, so that delivers five meals a week to approximately 45 local clients. And then we offer, um, we've, we provide, um, sorry, lunch and dinner service through the Seniors Housing Society. So we uh, also feed another 47 clients there twice a day. And then uh, we've got a food rescue program called Nourish, which is a partnership with the Salvation Army, the city of Fort St. John and local grocery stores to make sure that food that is still good to eat um, is being distributed to those that need it first. Right. I must thank, you know, NEAT and its management and team and volunteers for all these services across the communities. So these are so interesting programs and so valuable for the communities. So how can students at schools connect with the NEAT management team? Um, we're pretty available, um, which is lovely. So people are more than welcome to give us an email or drop us a, a note, uh, give us a phone call anytime. Um, we offer in-class services to local teachers and educators, um, and we're doing some work to develop education support mechanisms for educators. Um, but uh, yeah, we've got volunteer opportunities with um, Camp Wildlings. We've got a junior leaders program going on this year for 13 and 14 year olds, which is really exciting. And then we've got you know, gardens all over the place. We've supported um, science fair projects and all sorts of things. So um, when students come in and they ask a very specific question, usually it's, um, can you help me, you know, create a recycling program at school? Or can you help me understand how worm composting can be beneficial to our community? And uh, we're really excited to be able to support them in those endeavors. Thank you. And what are some annual events which are hosted by NEAT in the community? Oh, that one's a tricky question. Um, annual events are a little bit not annual at this point. <laughs> it's been an interesting two years. Um, so we have been hosting um, the Earth Hour Run, which is a 5K, and we haven't done that in a few years. COVID um, <laughs> has been a significant challenge there. Um, but most of our programming is on an annual basis. Um, we don't really have any big, big events except for bingo on Tuesday nights. So if you want to play bingo and support local programming, we'd love to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Good. And now talking about environment. So what does environmental sustainability mean to you? 
uh, balance, really. Um, and I, I think the unspoken thing under environmental sustainability is this idea that it's bigger than me, right? Um, we talk academically about, you know, balancing people and business and the environment. Um, but I think it's a little bit more, it's, it's more nuanced than that, especially when you get it into your home, right? And as we're dealing with inflation, we're dealing with all of these pieces. And sometimes the best laid plans just really fall at the feet of, I, I can't afford that, right? I would love to be able to, you know, install solar panels or a geothermal system or some of those big, fancy, shiny pieces. Um, but I think sometimes we lose track of the fact that, you know, walking or biking is actually a really significant decision to be making on a daily basis. Um, and yeah, so um, in terms of what the environment means to me, I think it's just everything around us, right? And the thing that I constantly remind myself is that we're connected to it. We cannot exist without it. It can exist without us. <laughs> and uh, that's a good reminder, I think, to my ego, but also to, to the world's as well. Thank you. And how do you think the governments can do more at a global level? Um, I don't want to get into too much hot water here, but um, <laughs> the there there's nothing we can't do. It's just political will, right? And I had this conversation with uh, the NCLGA the other day around food security, right? There's absolutely no reason why people in our community are going to bed hungry. None. <laughs> we have enough money. We have enough food, right? There is a will here that we need to address. And at some point in time, maybe we just need to be honest about the fact that we don't want to do that. Right. And I think uh, in terms of, you know, international and multinational government corporate or corporations, but also cooperation, um, there needs to be political will and an understanding beyond the election cycle that the environment is the thing that sustains us all. It's not something that we can afford to be like, we'll deal with it later next term, you know, or whatever. Like it needs to be incorporated into absolutely every decision that's being made because it's being impacted by every decision that's being made, right? Um, and I think that where there's a will, there's a way. Um, and there's no reason why we can't balance all of those pieces off, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. And there is a famous quote here from Wendell Berry, the earth is what we have common among us. So please tell us about that. Well, I think he's spot on. <laughs> it's very true. Um, we all live here and, you know, geopolitical and economic boundaries are really just lines on a big blue ball, right? We, we drew them and uh, there's no reason why we can't change them for one thing, but also um, there's, there's no reason why it needs to stop us, right? So the reality of the fact is that we as, you know, G8 members or really, you know, developed countries in the world are making decisions that are impacting some of the poorest nations around the planet. Um, and that's really starting to come to light as we see an increase in um, extreme weather events. Um, we're seeing an increase in the politicization of water resources. And I think we're going to see even more of that kind of across the globe going forward. Um, we're all, I just looked out the window today and I was like, oh, gas went up 20 cents overnight. Um, you know, that is, that experience I think is gonna become more and more and more common. And um, when we think about what's good for me, um, we also should be thinking about what's good for our neighbors and the community around us. Thank you. Who is your favorite author? Oh, <laughs> I'm not sure I can narrow that down. That's a hard question. Um, I read a lot of things. Uh, Bernie Brown's a really popular one right now. Um, and then, yeah, I'm, I'm reading a lot about leadership and I'm reading a lot about interconnectedness um, and also the, you know, almost how to preserve your humanity in really tough situations. And I think that that exploration really leads itself to environmental um, considerations and environmental programming as we go forward because there's just 
no place that I think more vulnerable than saying, actually, maybe we shouldn't cut that down. Or maybe actually we should, you know, ensure that we're considering the full ramifications of the programming and, and the decisions that we're making. Um, it's a vulnerable space. It's something that isn't fully incorporated into our economic system. It's not something that's fully incorporated into our political system. And so being willing to you know, step forward and say, actually, this is an important piece and we need to really flesh out the law of, you know, intended but also unintended consequences as we are making policy and we are starting programming and we are, you know, trying to actually make our community a more livable, workable, walkable, supportive space. Um, maintaining humanity through that's important. Good, thank you. And now we are in the year 2022. So with all these developments going on in the world, how do you think the role of, you know, environment has again been highlighted? You got the heavy hitters today, Faisal. Um, <laughs> I think BC has been on the front line. Um, I think that in the past couple of years, we've seen some pretty significant weather events. Um, and there's this, there's this desire to not scare people. But I also think that that desire to not scare people needs to be balanced with the reality of the world around us. Um, and more and more and more clearly, we're seeing the impacts of the decisions that we've been making for the last 30, 40 or 50 years, right? Climate change isn't a new topic, right? But it's something that's starting to impact us on a daily basis, but also so, so more frequently, but also more severely. And so when we're talking about heat domes and when we're talking about crops and we're talking about droughts and we're talking about, you know, um, shifting patterns of precipitation and those things are all going to have really, really significant impacts on our ability to feed ourselves, um, but also our ability to be um, politically secure as a nation uh, going forward. And so those are those are big drums to be beating, but they're important pieces to be considering as we as we move forward through this year. Um, we, especially through COVID, I think saw a lot of of systems planning fall with the assumption that um, everything else is business as usual, right? So if you know there's an increase in pressure on, say, the healthcare system, we're assuming that the education system is able to step in or the social system's able to step in at full capacity. And we've seen it over and over and over again that that's not the case. And I think that is a really important lesson to be carrying forward, um, both provincially, nationally, but also internationally, that um, all of these pieces are interconnected and it, it, we will not have the luxury of just dealing with one issue at one point in time. We have to look at them as a basket, which comes back to your quote that, you know, the environment really is all we have in common. And it, we are not doing ourselves any favors by trying to conceptualize them in silos. Thank you. And lastly, how do you think our beautiful British Columbia can be preserved better? I think it all comes down to respect and communication. Um, I don't think we're all ever going to agree, um, but I think the ability to step back and really explore where people are coming from and why um, they feel the way that they do. So if we can lead with curiosity um, and really try and escape the sound bite, I think, is also the bigger piece. Um, reconciliation is obviously needs to be a very uh, significant priority as we move forward as a province. Um, and the, I think even as a multicultural society, like there are so many worldviews that are represented here in this province right now. And we will never go wrong with taking the time to really dive into them and see um, what we can build upon and the connecting collaborative pieces that can carry us forward. Thank you. And in the bigger picture, when the Earth is a tiny little planet in the vast universe, mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel and which direction do you think we are moving? Counterclockwise. No. 
<laughs> just a little more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I just. It's overwhelming. I try not to think about it too much. It makes me a little anxious. Um, but also, it's a good reminder to me that a lot of the things that I'm stressed out about are insignificant, right? Some of the things that I'm stressed out about are, are incredibly significant. We occupy a, a little blue dot in the middle of space. And I think it really is our privilege, but also our responsibility to care for it carefully. Um, it's been here for so long, and it shouldn't take us 200 years to make it inhabitable, right? So, or uninhabitable. <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, every few weeks we find about some dis discoveries. There was, you know, NASA's, dis and then uh, Trappist-1, seven Earth-like planets so far away. And recently there was another video which has been released by NASA, which is about uh, some sounds coming from, from a black hole. So, you know, there are so many fascinating things and we are learning more and more. So what would be your message for the environmentalists and for our community? Stay curious. There's a lot here that we don't know, right? And it's so exciting. I love um, taking a look at the pictures coming back from Mars. Like it just blows my mind every day, um, but I think there's a lot of equally really exciting and influential things that we could be learning about our own planet, um, but it involves taking a step out of our comfort zones, and I would strongly encourage everybody to do that on a daily basis. Thank you. And do you have some interest in SpaceX and, you know, humans going to Mars and settling there, or do you go with that idea? So I hope really seriously that we don't ruin this planet and just move on to the next one. I hope that we take what we learn there and can apply it here. Um, but outside of that kind of fear, um, I'm really fascinated about what's happening and I'm curious to see it evolve. Thank you. And, and you know, NEED plays a very important role in our community, all of us being members of the global community. We feel the sadness is there when we heard about uh, so many things going on also in Kenya and then the drought and unfortunately, you know, the loss. Sometimes we hear the same tragedies, you know, in British Columbia, sometimes globally, and we realize we are all in this together and we should do our best again. So thank you viewers and thank you very much, Karen. We really appreciate your time and the services NEED provides to our communities. Thank you so much viewers and we'll be back with the next episode hopefully in a few weeks time thank you